Yeah. Hi, Karina. Hello. Paul, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> we'll call the meeting to order. Welcome to our audience here in attendance. Welcome as well to anybody joining us uh, via the live stream or tuning in at a later date or hour. Um, this is the time and place for the regular school board meeting, uh, July 11, 2022. We'll introduce the folks here at the board table to my right, Zach Wall, Bonnie Lowry, Jan McGinnis. To my left, Sarah Faltis. Uh, here at the center table, to my right, Paulette Newbold, the board secretary. To my left, Dr. Theron Schutte, the superintendent of schools. And joining us uh, virtually is uh, Karina Hernandez. And I am Sean Heitman. For those of you who may wish to give public comment, uh, we do have a pink sign-up sheet on the speaker's table. Uh, please understand that per board policy, board members will not respond to comments. Uh, also, please understand that Iowa law prohibits discussing specific employees of the district or their job performance. Would you all please join me in the mission statement of the school district? We develop we learners, learners who have the knowledge, knowledge skills, and positive, positive mindset, mindset to, to successfully pursue a meaningful future through personalized learning experiences. experiences. And please stand as you're able and join in the pledge. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. Are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, yes, uh, we have a small change under recognitions where we're including a uh, recent donation from MacDyne for the sports program. And then I also have a, uh, an amendment to the personnel consent agenda that's on the screen. Um, we'll be removing Madison Wilkerson, unfortunately. She is unable to join us uh, due to contractual obligations at her current position, so she's being removed as a new hire. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve. Second. Lowry Faltis. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Motion carries six to zero. Adam? Good evening. Um, so tonight we wanted to recognize uh, a very, very successful, another record-breaking year uh, for the Bobcat golf outing. So uh, uh, Marshalltown High School Director of Activities, Ryan Isgrig, is here, and he's uh, going to speak to the great numbers we saw this year. Yep, thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, it was another great event this year. Uh, last year we raised $25,000 uh, to support Bobcat Activities. This year we're able to raise $34,000 for Bobcat activities. Um, before that, I think the highest was around fourteen, fifteen thousand 15,000 in there. So um, I think we've obviously made some great strides in the event, uh, a lot of momentum. We had 35 groups in the AM, 35 in the PM, something like that. It changed a lot that last week. So <laughs> thank you were full on the PM 36, 36, right? So um, it was a great day. We had, of course, tons of alumni out there, and we had our own teams out there shaking hands and uh, putting events on. Our softball team was out there. Um, our dance team was out there. Our football team was out there as well. So it was great to see that. We had several coaches who played, uh, alumni, like I said, and just uh, community members and, and people come back from all over the the country to to play in that. So it's, it's, it's almost like a mini class reunion of many classes. So it's, <laughs> it's really, it's a really fun event. Um, it's a lot of work though, man, I was, I was tired after that day. And then I had two days of softball after that. So didn't get much of a break till Sunday, but, um, it was totally worth it again to support, uh, our student athletes and, um, 
a lot of work goes into it. I don't want to um, thank too many people because I'm sure I'll forget someone, but just uh, from my staff, uh, Gene Wilkins, Cindy Brock, uh, Stacy Galima, and of course the American Legion Golf Course for for hosting us. We had several several community sponsors that um, uh, supported us, so we can't thank them enough as well. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and I had just a quick thing, a couple quick things as points of information. Um, MacDyne, we had applied for a grant through the MacDyne um, Community Foundation or what have to help support our esports program, and they had recently notified us that uh, their committee chose us for a twenty-five hundred dollar award, which will be matched uh, by another 2500 through um, some of the owners and um, that check will be written to the foundation so we'll see that those funds through the foundation and then we've also have a, a verbal and written commitment for another five thousand dollars through another local uh, tech oriented company and so we've got a total of ten thousand dollars coming to help support expenditures to get the esports program off the off the ground uh, the other thing that i wanted to mention that we're really excited about um, we have the final two days of our teacher externship academy which we brought back uh, post covid this thursday and friday and thursday which focuses on health sciences and services we've got a commit a uh, tentative verbal commitment and written commitment from the lieutenant governor to actually come and speak a little bit about the governor's future ready initiative as well as the importance of um, getting our as many students as possible future ready to fill our future our current and future employment pipeline so we're real excited uh, to have the lieutenant governor um, Shauna is partly to thank for that as being a classmate of the lieutenant governor and then both Shauna and I are uh, graduates of his alma mater so we tried to leverage everything we could to get up here so. but that'll be exciting he's going to be at the Iowa Veterans Home at nine o'clock to uh, help kick off the day cool turning to the consent agenda with minutes from the June 20th uh, board meeting. Dr. Ryan, anything to note in personnel? No, sir. Looking at interagency agreements and contracts, uh, we have a purchase agreement for 220 and 226 East Main Street. Uh, a letter of agreement with Granite Government Solutions in the amount of $738.50 per month for SIP trunking. What is SIP? It allows phone call or phone systems that run on voice over IP, so networked phones to work over the internet rather than how we remember them working with operators and analog lines. A quote from Dactronics for $86,171 for a Dactronics scoreboard for the pool area. A memorandum of understanding with Iowa Valley Continuing Ed for the Teacher Para Educator Registered Apprenticeship Program, and then two agreements with Traffic Logics: one for the installation of a Save Pace Evolution Driver Feedback Signage Kit, and one to install speed cushions, which sounds soft and delightful, <laughs> <laughs> on Bobcat Boulevard. <laughs> Questions about any of those agreements? I had one question about the memorandum of understanding with the teacher paraeducator, mm -hmm. and it was down in um, section 3A. I didn't quite understand um, where it, it, especially the first part where it talked about the $21,000 per apprentice within the paraeducator program not to exceed 7000 which was okay. Um, and then the thirty-four thousand, not to exceed seventeen. So, how did we come up with those numbers? I, I guess I just don't quite understand. Sure. To make it short and sweet, it's all state provided. 
Um, the students can earn, as they're working as a pair, they can earn $12 an hour and they can participate for three years. So that's saying 7,000 annually, seven times three at 24,000 total. If you're looking at, is that, or sorry, 21,000 total at letter A. Mm -hmm. And then the next one for the 34, but yep, 17. That's, yep, so that's the teacher pathway. That's actually not um, the MOU that you're seeing here because this is an agreement with Iowa Valley. That's a two-year. Does that make sense? So the 17 double. So it's a two-year apprenticeship uh -huh. for 17,000. And I guess year. what didn't make sense is because it looked like it was a three-year agreement for the 21 to the 7,000 and only a two-year from the 34 to the 17. Yep. So one is a three-year plan, the other is a two-year plan. And this agreement is specifically for the student to okay. pair a pathway. So okay. we don't really need the 17 to 34 one in there? Not for this MOU. Okay. Right. And just as a reminder, we're, we're actually part of two grants. One, which we wrote, which was which also represented, I think it was eight other school districts in our area, <clears throat> for just the student to pair a piece. Right. That's all we applied for. But we're also part of the Rural Schools of Iowa um, grant, which was approved, and that's for the para-to-teacher okay. part. Um, Iowa Valley would not be involved in that one. Um, they don't have the four It'd be Western Governors degree. University. Okay. That's part okay. of that. All right. Just a little confused about the two different amounts. But so thank there, you. Yeah, those are all um, state guidance, essentially. We've received the maximum amount that we can for the number of students that are participating, okay. which is excellent. And the maximum number of students, uh, I can't remember now, was it? Nine? Ten? We are hoping to have ten. And that's from each district? No, ten from our district. Every district contributed a different number of students. I see. And okay. we have a goal at ten, but honestly, if we were able to surpass that, we believe we could potentially do yeah, so. Yeah, we also put in for up to ten students um, with the Rural Schools of Iowa and five adults, I believe. Thank you for the explanation. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yep. And which university did you say was working on the one for the? Uh, the Rural Schools of Iowa partnered with Western Governors University, um, which is a fully online programming. Okay, looking at open enrollments, there are four, uh, three out and one in. Paul, had anything to note in bills? Yes, sir. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. Lowry Faltis, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. Motion carries six to zero. I think we're good for public comment. Lynn? Thanks for having me tonight. Um, I kind of just wanted to have an opportunity to tell you a little bit about how our year went last year and um, get some changes for the upcoming school year in front of everyone here. So last year was a busy year and we had a good year. Um, you know, we have roughly 45 team members this year helping to prepare meals for students. And the numbers that, you know, this small group was able to turn out is quite impressive to me. So we had over 300,000 breakfasts served last school year, nearly 600,000 lunches served last year, and over 330,000 snacks prepared last year. And, you know, I was roughly thinking about, you know, th those numbers of meals and snacks we probably gave out over a million servings of fruits and vegetables over the course of last school year. So we're serving up nutrition. And I'm, I'm proud of the things that our department is doing. So last school year, if you remember, we operated under the seamless summer option of the food service 
um, of the summer program for the school year. And we did follow the regular national school lunch program meal pattern, but operating under the seamless summer option allowed us to receive a higher reimbursement rate per meal um, than what's traditionally available through the national school lunch program. And it also allowed all students to have universally free meals throughout the course of the school year. We also are a recipient of the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program grant, and that is available for kindergarten through sixth grade students. And this is actually a really cool thing that Marshalltown kids get because we apply for this grant every year and we usually do qualify for the grant, but it's something that really sets us apart to schools that don't qualify for the grant. So it does allow those elementary age kids to have a fourth of a cup fruit or vegetable snack every day. And you know, the snacks do have to be fresh fruits and vegetables. So it provides a great opportunity for kids to have a little extra nutrition in their day, but also a learning experience. So with this grant, there's a nutrition education component that's required. And so not only are we offering them something to eat, but an experience. So we aim to provide nutrition education with the snack that teaches them about, you know, if you're in the grocery store, you should try to like pick the fruits at this ripeness, um, look for these kind of qualities and things you might be picking. How do you prepare it? So if you, you know, if you take this home, what do you do? What are the steps before you actually eat it? So, and then, you know, we try to say, you know, these foods are high in vitamin C or fiber and why that's good for you. So it's a really cool experience that Marshalltown kids get that kids in surrounding districts do not get. So it's something that I'm really proud of that we get to offer this to our students here. And then additionally, we had um, after school care snacks to help supplement those um, programs that are enrichment activities for um kids after school. So we have a lot of great things going on in our department and for the kids here in Marshalltown. So next year, we do have some changes that are really important that, you know, parents um, hear about. So the universally free meals are ending for those students that attend in grades 7 through 12th, and um, that would be Miller and the high school. So Free introduced meals will still be available for um, students attending in those buildings as long as they qualify with their household income. So free introduced applications are available in the Infinite Campus Parent Portal for families to fill out. And um, starting here in August, we plan to send out several communications to families um, to remind them to do that if they haven't done so already. But I'm happy to say that since the application opened on um, July 1st, we've already had several come through and we're in the process of getting all of those um, processed. So we're happy to see those rolling in. And then we just really want parents to know that it's important to apply for their application prior to the start of the school year so that we can avoid any unnecessary charges to the lunch accounts if we can do that. So students can qualify for free and reduced meals in a variety of different ways. And, you know, we kind of talked about the household application already, but we also will receive, will receive direct certification lists twice monthly with student names that are sent to us directly from the state. And the reason we get those names is because they're, be, they're associated with other programs that already have income eligibility, such as food assistance, temporary need of assistance, Medicaid programs, things like that. So families will get a letter from us if their student is um, qualified for free reduced meals via direct certification. Um, the other way students can qualify for free meals is the household application, which is available in the parent portal. And if a student had an eligibility on file from the 2022 school year, that does carry over for the first 30 days of school. So those are set to expire on October 4th of 2022. 
And then we do um, plan to continue on for the CEP program, the community eligibility provision um, for students in PK through sixth grade, and then also MLA. So next year, um, if a student doesn't qualify for free reduced meals, the lunch prices are here on the, on the slide. And then adult price, which we're going to talk about after my presentation, will be um, 413 pending approval. So we're really hopeful that you know parents can get their applications in if they think they might qualify for free or reduced, and our office is prepared to get responses out to anybody who applies quickly. And then I thought this might be kind of like a good opportunity to go over a little bit about what our meals look like. So under the National School Lunch Program, we do serve um, breakfast and lunch that follows the meal pattern set by the USDA. And so a meal um, has fruit, grains, and milk at breakfast. And then the meat and meat alternates are optional. And we do try to serve those at least two times a week at breakfast just to kind of round out the meal and give them a little bit of protein. But you can see as the kids get older, there's a little bit higher requirement for the amount of food that is to be given. But you can see this slide or the picture on the slide there. That's a really um, typical breakfast that we might serve, like a grain-based entree with you know, a full cup of fruit if a student wants a full cup of fruit and then milk to round out the meal. And then lunch um, consists of five meal com or food components. So we do offer the grains and the meats. And again, as the kids get older, we are required to offer just a little bit more to those kids as they get older with the fruit half a cup at the elementary and middle school level, and then a full cup daily at the high school level, and then three quarter cup of vegetable every day to students in grades K through eight, and then a full cup of vegetable offered at the high school level. When we do offer vegetable, we also have to offer a certain amount of vegetable from the specific subgroups. So throughout the week, students are gonna be offered vegetables from the dark green category, which is like your broccoli, spinach, romaine lettuce, things like that. Red orange, which would be carrots, bell peppers, beans, peas, legumes. So we do a lot of refried beans, baked beans, hummus, and then starchy vegetables, which is like your potatoes, and then other, which would be like celery or iceberg lettuce, things like that. And then um, milk is offered every day, one cup portions and so we do a variety of chocolate and white milk um, one percent in skim and then additionally we do nutrition analysis of our menus and we keep our saturated our total calories from saturated fats less than 10 percent and then zero trans fats we also have um, targets for sodium and calorie limits but i didn't put those up on the slide because we're getting into the nitty-gritty there so we keep an eye on all that additionally for the upcoming school year we do plan to return to offer versus serve for our meal program so during the pandemic and under the seamless summer option the way we were conducting meal service which was not always in the cafeteria. It was really hard to do the offer versus serve, but we do intend to go back to that this school year. So when students come through the cafeteria to select their meal, they are allowed to decline up to two meal components at each um, meal. So if they don't want milk, they don't have to take milk, for example. Or if they really hate carrots and that's one of their vegetable options for the day, they could decide to say no thank you to the carrots. Um, and this just helps us to be more efficient in the amount of food that we prepare and having less food waste. So it's a good option for our students. So you can see, again, these are you know typical meals that we might serve and just kind of how the nutrition breaks down. So the hamburger counts as the two ounce meat, meat alternate and then the bun is the two grain. Then we have the half a cup of ranch wedges, which is 
a half a cup starchy vegetable, salad, which is the dark green, a pear, and milk. So that would be like if a student took everything offered, they could have, you know, a quite full tray. Um, but then you could also imagine if a student didn't like um, ranch wedges, they could say no thank you and they could take everything else if they wanted to. And then, you know, we really pride ourselves on choices. So as the kids get older, especially into Lenahan, Miller, and the high school, often we do offer um, fruit and vegetable bars where they can go through and take, um, you know, as much fruit and vegetable as they would like. That's kind of, we do allow that. And then um, lots of times we have more fruit and vegetable choices available to students than what's actually on the menu at at those grade levels. And then um, we have some really nice salads and wraps that are also available for those older kids as well. So if a student wants to see the choices that's available to them at their school, we do have a, nutri a nutrition um, software and menu publishing available on our website. Can we go to the next slide? So on the district website, at the top of the page, you can see there's a button that has menus, and that's a link to each menu by school. So it's interactive, so students can go in there and see the menu, and then they can like hover on the menu item, and it'll pull up the nutrition information for that item. And if there's any extra choices available to them, they can see those choices there. There's like a widget on the side that populates um, the other choices that are available that might not be on the traditional calendar menu. So it also gives students the options to rate foods and how they like it, which helps to give us feedback about, you know, things they're liking and not liking. And um, so we really, we really like this tool and um, we think it's good and the students kind of like it too. And we have digital menu boards that populate at the school that they, they can see and it scrolls. So it's pretty cool. Um, so with that, you know, we're really excited for the 2023 school year. And um, I hope that this presentation kind of helps get that message out to parents one in one more way. And um, with that, do you have any questions? Uh, question I have is you talked about the grant for the younger kids. I know towards the end of the year it seems like they run out of uh, the fruits and vegetables. Is there anything we can do differently at all? Or Yeah, so the grant, you know, I think it allows 27 cents per snack um, and that money does go pretty quick. So I think this year we ran out of funding mid-May. Um, so we had to cut off the grant program a little before the end of the school year. And, you know, we can definitely do a better job of um, encouraging kids who don't want the snack not to take the snack so we don't have to prepare so many. And, um, yeah, there's definitely some things we could probably look to stretch our money just a bit further. But that per, that per price, um, you know, re that we get for the snack is – a little on the low side compared to what it takes to make the snack, but we're always looking for ways to be more efficient. Is it when you're talking about with the, the older kids having to apply to help out with the free or reduced lunch, explain when they enroll for the next year, is that part of the process or is this, or they have to do it on top? How does that all work? Oh, the fresh fruit and vegetable program grant? No, or? The, for the older kids for the free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. So they make sure that the parents are aware, is it when they enroll for the school year that's when they apply or when do you when they do this okay this. so the <clears throat> there's a link to the application in registration that right before they submit their registration it says don't forget to apply but it is another step in addition to the registration and it can be done at any time so um, they can go into their portal and find the meal benefits application at any time and that's actually a really good point because even families who apply maybe initially at the beginning of the year, if they have a change in their income throughout the year or like a change in their household num number of members in their household, they can always go back and fill out a new application at any time. Okay. Yeah, it's always available.
And, and one last question. Do you let the kids ever decide the menu for the month at all? We've done that. <laughs> well, not for the month, but we have done a day before. And that's something that we should revisit because it's really fun when the kids have their own ideas about the foods they'd like to see. I always get steak. And I say, oh, steak, you know, how about Salisbury steak? <laughs> and, you know, then they get a little less excited. But, you know, that is fun to get their feedback. And in the past, I know watermelon and strawberries, those have always been a hit, too, on the student menu day. But, yeah, that would be something fun to revisit this school year. It is fun. Anything else? Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll just stay put. <clears throat> so I last um, came at the first board meeting of June and presented meal price recommendations to you. And on June 20th, right after that meeting, the USDA came out with guidance for the adult price meal. And so the USDA has sent a minimum they have set a minimum price requirement for adult price meal of $4.13 for the 2023 school year. Initially, I had suggested to increase it by a dime to $4.05 per meal. And, you know, that did fall short of what the USDA is going to require for the next school year. And the $4.13 is based on the free student reimbursement plus any performance-based reimbursements the district is receiving, and then the USDA food meal rate for the 23 school year. And so when you add up those three dollar amounts, the total does come out to be $4.13. So I, I do recommend that we increase the adult price meal to 4 13 so we're compliant with the USDA guidance for the 23 school year. Other questions for Lynn? Is there a motion to approve the adult meal price of $4.13 for the 22-23 school year? So moved. Second. McGinnis Lowry, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries 6 to 0. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. Hello. So this is, uh, continues to be the time of year where we renew things. Um, we also get prepared for the upcoming year. Something that we knew was underway, but that we hadn't been um, able to kind of quickly test and implement. It, it's just taken several months to figure out the direction that we want to go is a new way for staff and students to authenticate to our wireless um, access. So right now there are a couple what we'd call SSIDs, wireless access um, titles that you would see and you'd be able to join from your device. And when you click on those, sometimes they ask you for a password. So this new technology enables us to do that more quickly with fewer errors, and it's replacing an outdated technology that we need to replace. So we looked at two main um, vendors. One is Aruba ClearPass. Aruba purchased Hewlett Packard, so that might sound familiar. And that software is considered agnostic, which means it can work with many different platforms. The one we compared it to was called Cisco ICE, and that platform only works with Cisco devices. We have a lot of Cisco equipment. Um, you'll see our wireless access points are Cisco. Um, however, we felt if we made a big investment in that, it would kind of... Um, shoehorn us into continuing down that route when we might want some other options. So we thought with features and with that agnostic um, feature as well, we would go with Aruba ClearPass. So we are 
recommending that we replace our previous system, our radius server, with Aruba ClearPass. Are there questions for Amy? So it's more expensive up front, but your annual recurring costs are less, and you can use it over more platforms or more devices? Yes, exactly. It does look as though it has a heftier price tag, but within a couple years, you'll see it. it we, we're hoping this, what we'll implement will actually be a virtual server, so it's actually not even a physical thing that we're buying here. But we're hoping to at least get five or six years out of this. So within a couple years, um, the cost would actually become less than what Cisco ICE would be. Can you explain what this actually does? Yeah, so it helps your device. So any device, whether you be a guest that walks in, quickly and easily connect to our internet in a secure way. Or we have all of our what's called MAC addresses for our devices sort of registered with this. So we say these are all the devices we bought. Automatically allow these to connect <coughs> to an even, even higher quality production wireless. So the district devices get the best Wi-Fi and our guests get some pretty good Wi-Fi and they connect pretty quickly. But we separate that out to be as secure as possible. Makes sense. Any other questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the purchase of ClearPass through Riverside Technologies, Inc. with an initial cost of $38,936.77 and an annual recurring cost of $2,873.41? Move to approve. Second. Wall Lowry. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries six to zero. Thank you. Thank you. We have one uh, policy as a first reading that's coming back. It's 804.5 stock prescription medication supply. Uh, Stacy Tool Crawford and the other district nurses brought this forward as a uh, new policy that they would like the board to adopt. And so I would recommend, there have been no changes since you saw it at the last meeting, I'd recommend adopting and waiving the second reading. Is there a motion to waive or to adopt? Uh, well, are there any questions to start with? Is there a motion to adopt uh, policy 804.5 and waive the second reading? Move to approve. Second. Lowry Wall, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. As far as the initial review policies, uh, 402.2 child abuse reporting was uh, reviewed by Dr. Ryan and we're recommending that simply be marked as reviewed. Uh, no changes to that. Any questions on 4022? And then um, the remaining policies are Recommendations to amend, the first of which uh, Amy Harmson has brought forward, 401.13 staff technology. We've taken the existing policy and added expectations as it relates to email use uh, to that policy. And so that would come back for a first reading. And then we have uh, three policies which are rec uh, changes as it relates to recent legislation that was passed. 501.14 open enrollment transfers, procedures as the sending district. 507.2 administration of medication to students. And 507.2 E1 authorization for asthma or other airway constricting disease medication or epinephrine auto injector self-administration consent form. Uh, those are all with amendments based on recent Iowa legislation. So those would come back at, for first reading. Are there any questions about any of those policies? I do have a question about the open enrollment and transfers. Yeah. I noticed that in the policy all the dates are taken out and there aren't dates that are put back in. 
So could you help educate us? Is there has there been a change in the yeah, deadline date? And there are no deadlines now? anymore. No for deadlines open anymore. So it's free game. Yep. Open enrollment at any time. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, and it, it, the approval of such uh, is solely on the receiving district. Got it. Other questions? Oh, just um, not so much a question as just for the public to be aware that um, on the medication, if parents want um, vitamin supplements and things like that administered at the school, that they need to get that in writing from the medical personnel, that the school nurse cannot just automatically do that. Let me see if I can find that policy. I just read that and I thought, oh, where was it? Administration of medication. But I thought, I just don't want to put the school nurse in a position where she has to um, mediate with parents over that. Um, here it is. Alternative medications such as remedies, enzymes, herbs, vitamins, dietary supplements, homeopathic medicines, or medications from other countries will not be administered to students without the following. A written order from a health care provider with legal Iowa prescriptive authority and a written request from the parent or guardian to follow the health care provider's order. I just, um, I understand why it's there. I just want people to be aware that it's there. And that wouldn't be new, right? I mean, that's the existing policy. No, it doesn't policy. look like it's a change. It looks like it's just the way it's been. So that's not like anything that... No, it's just... Okay. <laughs> yeah, no change, it's just making sure people are aware. Okay, any other questions about those policies? With the exception of 4022, they're all coming back next time around, so. Adam, you're up. Hello again. Uh, so tonight, uh, it's a very exciting and important uh, just a bit of information and discussion. So you can see we have a recommendation for a replacement uh, district logo, for specifically the logo uh, with the star uh, that we've had for, gosh, I don't, I don't even know how many years I haven't been able to find that information, but it's been a while. Um, and in the, as part of the website update and uh, uh, upgrade process, uh, we are, uh, presenting this logo to uh, go with that as part of that work and as part of overall district branding uh, to, to update that. Um, notes on this logo from Juicebox who provided uh, the design. Uh, the block M is more traditional, is a more traditional choice and aligns well with your current branding. Uh, we paired the mark with a clean, versatile font. The badge, which is what you can see up there, uh, is more formal than the previous option containing the full name of the school district. We also experimented with, uh, oh, it's, well, placing, superimposing the bobcat over it, uh, similar to uh, another of our existing logos. So um, that's a little bit of background about the design uh, history behind that logo. Um, as far as the process for deciding upon this as a recommendation, uh, this is from feedback from our website task force, which is made up of several staff members, uh, students, and uh, Kylie Leisure at, at uh, Vision, or pre I guess previously of uh, Vision Marshalltown, um, and her expertise with, with branding, and uh, especially in this community. So um, this was uh, one of the most popular and, and definitely had the had the support of everybody uh, uh, among the many many options we were we were presented with this this was one of the ones that really uh, everybody felt good about so do you have any questions for me i think you guys did a great job it's simple and i like it mm -hmm. thank you yes. yeah. what all does this go on <laughs> uh, just about just about everything. I mean, so I'm, this, I'm so looking at the poster behind you yeah. it, that as would, an example. That would be the type of that would be mm -hmm. yes uh, banners um, are Let, obviously oh, letterhead. Le, it, yes, it would act as a letterhead. 
uh, for official documents. It would go on our website and be prominently featured there, of course. Um, you know, it, pretty much any use that we have for, for the star logo now, this would be a direct replacement. Well, and I think, wasn't there a, a rendition using this font that uh, was kind of circular in a shirt that would yeah. be appropriate for t-shirts or whatever? I do have, if we want to throw that up, I, I can send it to you very quickly. Okay, I can, we can throw that up. Yeah, so the interest, having been part of this discussion, um, as we were looking at other more, I guess you'd call them modern uh, ways, <laughs> um, you know, it, our minds kept going back to, you know, like the work of the Assistance League and putting those huge M's in front of all of our buildings. And, you know, how much, if any sense, would it make to move away from that at this point, you know, with that kind of investment the other thing um is i think you know this m resonates with with graduates of of marshalltown high school more so than you know if we went with a flying m or something that that looked more non-traditional and so um i would say that both juice box and through adam's guidance we looked at a lot of different options but at the end of the day it really came back to this look which was more traditional and and i think professional looking quite honestly yeah no i i guess from my perspective i like the logo i'm just trying to think of all the, right. the different documents and other things that are going to have to be changed yeah. regardless but yeah, yeah. Yes, yep, that, that will be, okay, and it looks like we got it. So you can see there that's uh, over on the, I guess, my right, my right, your guys' left. That's all right. Oh, you've got it up there, that's right. So that's more of the um, a circular badge. Um, some feedback we did give Juicebox at our most recent meeting was maybe the stars, perhaps replacing those with circles at, at the little, as the divider, small detail, but... Um, and then, I don't know, yeah. And then that's just uh, the M isolated so that you can get an idea of it without any other elements around it. So. Other questions? All righty. Um, other, otherwise, as far I believe my item is up next on the agenda. Mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Um, so yes, besides uh, this work, we also or I have also been um, just continuing on with with uh, various summer projects, uh, district calendar. Uh, I have just a couple more principals I need to meet with to uh, talk social media, um, but I'm hoping to get that wrapped up. If I can, I'd like to get uh, um, a couple of guideline documents ready to go for vetting uh, by the end of this week if possible so um, that works continuing and i feel good about getting that done here uh, as we go into the 22 23 school year and when you get this calendar done mm -hmm. is that going to appear on our website so all the it events will. if you pull it up they're all right there it will yeah yep we will uh, every year once that is published in print and distributed to the schools we also post it online Other questions for Adam? Okay, thank you, Adam. Okay, turning to reminders. Uh, looks like I have initial review policies for August. And remember, we only meet once in July, so we don't we won't see each other again until August first. Committee reports. I'm assuming we didn't have anything. So, what have we done this evening uh, to benefit the students of Marshalltown? I think we did a nice job of educating the board with regard to the nutrition at the yeah, lunch was, and the breakfast. That was well done. What goes yeah. on. Uh, if you don't have the opportunity to be there to see what children are picking up on their tray or how they go about doing it, it was nice to have that education for us. 
And I think also the um, paraeducator pathway for our students who would like to go into education and helping them um, take coursework there. I mean, growing our own. It's just really important that we continue to think about what we can do as a district to um, set ourselves up for future employees. And yep. so it's an awesome, awesome thing. I feel that uh, I think what helped tonight with Mr. Isgrig talking about how community minded our, our our community is with helping out with this year's Bobcat golf outing. Um, I mean, the research has showed that kids and activities uh, excel well, and uh, it's great to see the community involved there. Anything else from anybody? Oh, yes. <laughs> notice that. <laughs> Bieber. Bieber. <laughs> Justin Bieber. <laughs> okay, on that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Aye. Okay. Faltas Hernandez, all in favor say aye. 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 We are.